is Bronze and Modern Gods. I'm John. And I'm Richard. And we are here on a Monday with you, as usual, through the magic of pre-recording. I'm actually in Mexico City still, uh, but we put this one as in the can. <laughs> <laughs> Write your own jokes. Uh, if you're not following us on Facebook. Said, John? What's that? Sorry. <laughs> Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Bronze and Modern Gods. If you like this video, give us a like, subscribe. Uh, we'll, we'll try not to be too uh, innuendo y this week because we're talking about books with the purple label of death. Oh, yeah. Restoration. What happens when you get a book back? And it comes back restored. What does it mean? Is it is it as bad as it you think? Things are changing, I think, a little bit. We'll discuss that. Plus, our underrated books of the week, the 25-year rule. And let's start off with our hot book of the week, Richard. Take it away. Our hot book this week is JLA Avengers, the trade paperback from this month. Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty impressed with this. It's, it's It reprints all four issues of the 2003 series. It was written by uh, Kurt Busek and drawn by our, our 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 homie George Perez. Yes, and uh, this set everybody off because it was limited to seven thousand copies. Which um, why did they have to limit it? I mean, come on, guys, we're raising money. The all the proceeds, the original proceeds benefited the hero initiative which is kind of like a gofundme a, a fund that's set aside to help comic book creators in need with medical bills rent things like that so why limit it to seven thousand? because richard what happened because it's limited to seven thousand? Oh, it became almost unavail unavailable immediately uh when it came out uh there was people people hoarding this book uh, our, our our good friend evan uh got one of the three copies available at his store uh, it's you know it's one of those books that's that's hit the speculators um, pretty hard. Uh, you have a screen grab of an eBay sale, which is uh, I don't know how I feel about this five hundred and thirty five dollars this book sold for. Right. Uh, in, in in the actual listing of the seller says in the title that one hundred percent of the proceeds go to charity. Um, and I, I'm going to take them at their word that it's actually a brick and mortar store and this is their. Okay. eBay ebay uh account so uh that would be awesome if it gets if they double dip into the charity fund that would be amazing that is great uh, i just see a lot of people um flipping this book and you know a portion of the proceeds will go to the hero initiative all right can we define that portion or are you just gonna you know keep that info to yourself i don't know how i feel a, a part of me feels really gross seeing that uh part of me is mad at warner and uh Disney for limiting it to 7,000. Why? Why, guys? You're, it's, it's benefiting your creators. Limit it to 27,000. Limit it to 70,000. You would have sold 70,000 of this and made a lot of money for charity. I agree. Uh, I wonder if the fact that it's a trade paperback instead of a comic um, kind of made them limit the, the print run because trades don't sell as, as, in, in, as large of numbers as comics do. Maybe that's potentially the reason why. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe lawyers got involved. You know, that's the other thing that I, I smell business affairs all over this, um, which, you know, God bless you if you have a law degree. Uh, <laughs> all right. <laughs> and, you know, it's unfortunate. Uh, poor uh, George Press is um, currently dying from cancer and he's he is uh, in hospice at this point. So it would have been it would have been nice to, to be able to have even a bigger amount of money raised in his name. Uh, for his his uh, his charity fund, but let's look at the positives here. It did raise money, and George was here to see it happen, yeah. and uh, that's awesome because sometimes we don't let people know how important they are while they're still with us. So that was accomplished. Richard, you're important to me. John, I was about to say you're I important to me that. too. <laughs> I can't imagine my Mondays without you. <laughs> oh thank you all right let's move on before it gets too soppy in here our main topic this week is comic book restoration uh, suggested to us by our good friend steven at minor keys comics on instagram he wrote in uh wanting us to go over restoration what some of these terms mean uh whether the difference between a conserved and a restored book so we're going to try to break it down for you guys. And, and one thing I do want to discuss is how the market is changing 
when dealing with restored books. So a restored book is when the grader has determined that something has been done to alter the book from its original state. It could be anything from color touch to replacing staples, uh, over aggressive cleaning of the cover, uh, all sorts of things. Now, CGC has introduced another label in the last few years due to demand from some uh, collectors, and that is a conserved label. Now, whereas the restored label is purple, the conserved label is gray. Gray conserved books have, and this is a quote from CGC's site, specific repairs done to improve the structural integrity and long-term preservation. These repairs include tear seal support, staple replacement, piece reattachment, and certain kinds of cleaning. Now, what they're talking about here is if a book has rusty staples, if you leave a rusty staple on an Action Comics number one, it's going to ruin that book. It's going right. to eat through, yeah, that rust, and it's going to stain the book, and, and it's going to be awful. So you do want to remove that staple and replace it. Now, is a conserved book still as expensive as a blue label? The market says no. It's still has a little bit of uh, a bad look to it when it comes to reselling. Not as bad as a purple label, though. So, Richard, tell us about Color Touch. What is Color Touch for the, for the people that don't know? Color Touch is when, for example, you have a black cover and you have spine ticks on the spine, little white, little white marks that show up on the spine, and you take a black magic marker and you think you're slick and you use the black magic marker to, to put color in those little white um, spine ticks. Oh yeah, so, it happens with all colors. It happens with red, with uh, Incredible Hulk 181. Uh, happens with white, when white covers, people try to be slick. But some color touch can be removed. Richard, do you know what kinds of color touch can be removed versus what can't? Have you I've ever tried? I, 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 no, I've, I've, I've never tried. What, what, what kind can be removed? Some people have used acrylic paints Mm. on books to do a color touch especially back in the day because they, they thought they were being really slick and, and using like a paint and that actually can be scraped off with an exacto or a razor blade you're going to scrape off some of the cover with it so it's going to be left with like you know the white paper underneath but still some people think that's better than having a purple label yeah. what cannot be removed is Sharpie. Sharpie bleeds through that cover. That's one quick way to uh, test a book for color touch too, is open it up and look on the other side and see, is there bleed through from a Sharpie on the inside of the cover? Right. And you can tell color touch too, if you have a black light, uh, flashlight, um, if, you hold, if you hold it over a cover, you can see the differentiation in color between the normal cover and then that color touch part of the cover as well. Now, some people love getting their raws restored there there are people that do this professionally for a living especially i would think back in the 70s and 80s let's say back in the day you had a copy of uh submariner number one the first timely series right and it was missing a big chunk out of the back cover and there were tears on yeah. it and you know it was maybe a 2.0 but you wanted it to look good you wanted to display it you would send it to one of these professional comic book restorers and they would you know add a piece and, and do it by hand and make it look like a cutout coupon. And they would do leaf casting on the tears to reinforce it. So that's really where a lot of these older restored books come from, from back in the day. I don't think a lot of people do it now unless they have like a coverless Amazing Fantasy 15 and they get like a facsimile cover or something and put over top of it. No, uh, but I, I think that, you know, it as a conservation method is, is still popular. If, if you have an older, very valuable book that it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very rare book um, in order to conserve the book because over time, if, if the pages are brittle already and um, it's, you know, it gets to a point where to conserve the book, you have to put an effort in to do that. And yeah. that means doing, doing the things to protect it from basically disintegrating. Yeah, and very it, true. <laughs> in those instances, I think it's a smart move to do that, um, now you will you will get a gray label or a purple label depending on the extent of the, the the repair. But if you're looking at the longevity of that book as a collectible, I think that's still the smart play to make. 
Yeah, um, I think things have also changed where, you know, pre-slabbing days when you and I were coming up, tape was a big no-no. Right. Uh, and tape was considered even back then restoration in a lot of respects. One thing that changed that, I think, was CGC, you know, not considering tape as restoration because all of a sudden you saw books that had like a 1.8 when they got graded. All of a sudden they reappeared with tape magically uh, supporting the cover and they got a 3.0. Uh, there was a lot of controversy about that when it was first happening. Uh, so what do you think now with with these keys going into the literal hundreds of thousands of dollars is the purple label still verboten? I, I really don't think so. I, I, I have seen a number of instances of those super rare books. Um, of, you know, Amazing Fantasy 15 may not be super rare, but it's still highly desirable. Uh, people taking an opportunity to protect their investment by doing restoration on them. Um, and so, so why I think restoration still... Uh, a restored book of a certain grade is worth less than a book that is not restored of that same grade. I don't think it's a stigma as much for those, those super rare books. Now, if you're talking about, um, you know, uh, something that's not as rare, like uh, Werewolf by Night 32, and somebody color touches it, uh, that's a completely different story. That book is going to take a significant hit in its value because of that restoration. Um, and it's mainly because the restoration, I don't want to say it's done. Um, well, there is, there is amateur and there is professional. Right. And unfortunately, CGC does note it, but you have to look real close. It's in real small print. It's the same purple label, no matter which. Right. Right. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I think restoration still is not, um, is not, you know, it's not as valuable as, as a blue label. A purple label is not as valuable as, as a blue label. A purple label is not as valuable as a gray label, in my opinion. Um, and then you get the really fun ones where people, when they're signed books and you get a yellow label with a purple stripe or a blue stripe, or, you know, it's, it gets to be kind of crazy. But no, I, I, I think it has a place in, in, in the collector hobby. And it's, um, it's something that I don't have in my collection. But if, you know, if I had, um, if I had access to buy an AF15 5.0 restored, I would consider it. Yeah, the, the thing about this is there is the traditional thinking that a restored copy, a purple label, is worth one third mm -hmm. of the grade, the, the original grade, the blue label would have. So I don't know if that's the case anymore for some of these mega keys. I, I know it's definitely the case for lower tier books. Nothing's worse than like what happened to me. I think I had a two gun kid 75 that I sent in to get slapped and it came back restored. I'm like, who? Why? Why would you? Why don't you yeah. know? It just must have happened a long time ago, and I missed it. But that's the biggest bummer of all. That, and that's you, part, you know, that's one of the the, the risks you take when you buy, uh, you know, unslabbed books. Um, we've we've talked a lot about the the cost of CDC slabs and the hassle and all. But one thing that it does give you, it gives you uh, some protection against those kinds of things. You know, restoration, conservation. Um, you know, all those things are caught by CGC. So if you buy a slab, you have a, you know, if it's a purple label, it's a purple label, it's a blue label, it's a blue label. And it gives you that kind of confidence. There's my issue with CBCS as well. They note when something is restored, but they don't change the color of the label. It's just noted in text. So if you're at a show or something, or if you're a younger collector or not as knowledgeable, you could totally miss the fact that it's restored. CBCS, come on, get it. <laughs> why are you digging your heels in about your labels the design what a dumb anthill to die on i you know i they need to hire you for you know no, a, i don't want the job <laughs> <laughs> somebody yeah. needs to fix their labels it's it's, I, it's a differentiator they could really make make uh make good but they just uh, don't want to do it you know when our we've talked about cgc the last couple of episodes and people are like why aren't you going to cbcs well there's a yet another reason uh add it to the pile uh, but I think we should go back to the good old days before slabs, before we got sent books to be graded. When you did it yourself, you had to learn how all the way back to 1997, 25 years ago, 25 year old. Ow, uh, 25 year old this week. 
X-Men number 62, the variant cover. Did you know they were doing variant covers in 1997 there, Richard? Wow, no, that's that's pretty cool. This is an early this is an early variant cover. I don't know when the first variant covers were. I know when uh in the in the 2000s and the 90s when issue two would come out, they would do a variant cover for issue two to keep orders up. Uh, but they were evenly distributed. I think it was like 50, 50, but this was uh, a Shang-Chi crossover with the X-Men in this story. The X-Men travel to Hong Kong in search for a cure for the legacy virus. Were you reading this when the legacy virus was a thing? I, I, I was actually that. Yeah. Talk about a clumsy allegory. All right. right. Mutants, are, <laughs> mutants are an allegory for LGBT. Guess what the legacy virus is an allegory for? Can you guess, kids? <laughs> they didn't really go far, did they? It's not heavy-handed at all, is it? <laughs> this is also that weird period of the X-Men where Wolverine didn't have his animantium and he was devolved to this bestial state and he had different a different font for all of his dialogue and it was all growly and he wore, I don't know why he's wearing that do-rag over his eyes. Uh, he did. He had this bone claws. I mean, uh, the, let's, the positives, the positives. Great Carlos Pacheco art. Excellent. Uh, there are regular and direct versions of this as well with a different cover. A CGC 9.8 of the variant cover sold in January for $45. Meanwhile, though, a 9.8 of the regular cover sold this month for $153. Wow. Wow. I don't know. You guys are the ones buying this. You tell me. <laughs> Um, so yeah, X-Men 62, 25 years ago, hard to believe. Let's move on to our underrated books of the week. Richard, what do you got? My underrated book this week is Ms. Marvel number 16, the 2015 run. This is the first meeting of Kamala Khan and Carol Danvers. Uh, first meetings is becoming a thing. It's kind of like first solo title and first cover appearance. And, uh, people are collecting the first meeting of certain characters, so uh, my feeling is Carol, Carol Danvers and Kamala Khan are going to meet, if not uh, soon, in the, in the uh, Marvel's movie that's coming out next year. So this is a, this is a good book to pick up. Uh, so far, no one else has picked up on this book. There are only 11 books uh, total on the census and only two, point, uh, two 9.8s. Um, there are no 9.8s you know, on GPA. Um, Raws you can get for about 20 bucks. So if you're looking to spec for Kamala Khan and you're looking for a reasonably priced book, plus the cover is really cool looking. I really like the cover. I looked I looked to find the, who the artist was and uh, got stymied in, in the process. But uh, I think this is a good buy for 20 bucks. Not bad and uh, a lot of potential there. Uh, I uh, People seem to be uh, half and half on the trailer for Ms. Marvel. I thought it was great. Oh. <sighs> You know, we talked about it. I, I thought it was way too Disney like. It was too, it was too, um, you know, Disney TV show kind of stuff as opposed to Marvel. You're not the audience. I know I'm not the audience. And, and, uh, but otherwise, I think it's good. I think they, you know, they, they are going to alter her power set a bit. And that's, that's totally understandable. Um, so we'll see. Yeah. It, it attacks a different, completely different audience than me. Uh, the, and I hope they bring yeah. them in. Changing the power set is probably a really good move because that's been my biggest thing about Ms. Marvel is the goofy big fists. I see it and I'm like, I, I didn't understand that was the power. I thought it was really bad art and really <laughs> bad forced perspective. I honestly did. I was like, why do they keep drawing her like that? I'm like, oh, that's her power. She's like big, big arm wrestling fists. Okay. Okay. All right, we'll do that. Um, my underrated book this week is Rogue Number One, Sugar. Uh, this was that their that their first solo title. Oh. I can't do this. Please it's don't. Just, I'm it's not going to do the things I just don't like about Rogue. I know. I just that Chris Claremont dialogue for Rogue. I'm a h apostrophe m. I'm Rogue. Uh, she's really popular though. A uh, very popular X Man. Uh, this was a four-issue miniseries. It was her first solo title. It was published in 1995. It, because it was from 1995, of course it has a foil cover. Um, of course, there is a newsstand variant with a foil cover. Great art. Again, the positives. Mike Waringo and Terry Austin, it don't get no better than this unless it's Jack Kirby. And of course, 
Gambit is in this miniseries. You can't have Rogue without Gambit. A CGC 9.8 sold this month for 140 bucks. And get this, there is a 10.0 sale in GPA. It sold for $380 in 2005 so there is a 10.0 of this book it does have a cardstock cover so that's understandable oh, okay yeah keep those fingerprints off and, and those finger bends it must be before you know those finger ends were a thing <laughs> all right we are going to wrap it up for this week uh richard tell everybody where they can find us they can find us on on instagram or facebook at bronze and modern gods or the website www.bronzeandmoderngods.com Hit like, hit subscribe. Thank you all very much, and we will catch you next time. Everybody, stay safe.